Good evening all and welcome to the BCS Edinburgh, Edinburgh branch webinar, Design, Build and Testing of the World's Fastest Car, Bloodhound Land Speed Record. My name is Mike Hurst from BCS Edinburgh branch and I'll be handling the technical side of this meeting. Before we start, a quick intro to the GoToWebinar control panel for those who haven't used it before. You should see something like this uh, if you're using a desktop client. If you're using the in-browser client, then it's laid out a bit different. If you are having technical issues during the session, then please use the questions panel and I'll try and help. But basically on the top left, you've got four icons in a vertical row. The top one opens and closes your control panel. The circular microphone icon below that enables you to unmute and mute your microphone but before you can unmute your microphone, um, we have to enable that first. Uh, the bottom of those four icons is a raise hand icon. Click that and it raises a hand, and that's a method for asking verbal questions. The other way of asking questions is to type them into the uh, questions panel you see there, and then we'll get to see that text. Computer audio is what we would normally use. If you're having problems with computer audio, then you can switch to phone using the phone number in your uh, invite. So to allow smooth running of the session, I'll take questions on the presentation at the end. You, as I say, you can either type your questions via the questions box or raise your hand and we'll unmute you to ask your questions. We are recording this talk and it will be available on our BCS Edinburgh branch website and possibly the BCS YouTube channel. So I'll now switch presenters to Dan Evans, that's a Dr. Evans, and whilst I'm doing that, I'll hand over to Paul Rattray, Chair of Business Edinburgh Branch, to introduce our speaker for this evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you for attending, and thank you, Ben, for agreeing to come and do a talk for us. Um, I have to admit, I've got a bit of a slight agenda. I've been following Bloodhound since, since it was on a drawing board. Um, my name is on that fin in six points, traveling at 800 miles an hour or whatever, along with all of my children. Uh, and I did it before they put the prices up. Um, so I'm delighted to hear more about Bloodhound from the inside. Um, ben is, is just the expert in the fluid dynamics and how the air flows around this beast. It's a, it's a wonderful piece of engineering and a wonderful piece of of uh, STEM reaching out to children in primary schools and secondary schools and encouraging them to the next generation of technologists. Uh, ben, over to you. Fantastic. So I'm going to click show my screen and cross my fingers. Um, so first of all, um, many thanks, Paul, for the invitation uh, to speak here this evening. Um, and it's great to hear that this is a project that you've been following uh, for many years, like uh, many many people and uh, it's also it was lovely to hear that you you obviously get what this project is about uh, hopefully one of the things this talk will um, unpack a little bit is that you know fundamentally okay the engineering problem is how do you make a car go very fast but actually the broader objective of what bloodhound is all about um, is much wider and um, big thanks as well uh, to mike for sorting out all of the technical uh, uh, the technical issues that we've had this evening um and I say that uh, because if we do have any more, I'll, I'll just blame him. Um, so I'm hoping at this point, um, I can only see my own face at this stage, which is a little disconcerting, but I'm assuming you're all still there. Um, and I'm hoping that you can all see uh, my opening slide, which should say design, build and testing of the world's fastest car. Um, if you're not seeing that, I'm going to assume that someone is going to shout at me and say something's gone wrong. So. Um, I'm going to cover kind of the, the, the talk this evening in kind of four parts, um, but really the focus um, of what I talk about will be in parts one, parts four, really. Um, so, so I want to kind of dive in this evening uh, into some of the computational fluid dynamic modeling methods uh, that we have used and have developed specifically for uh, blood time to give you a feel for what kind of computing has gone into the aerodynamic design of Bloodhound. And if, if you're not familiar with you know, what aerodynamics is all about, basically um, it, it's the aerodynamics, the flow of the air around the car that has driven that external shape. So that, that car shape that you can see on this slide uh, is that shape because of all of the CFD modeling that we did over a period of, well, best part of a decade. 
Um, I'll, ve I'll ver very quickly go through parts two and three, which are about, you know, how did we build the car? What's it made of? That kind of thing. Um, and, and, a, and a brief um, overview of what we learned about the car, um, particularly when we took it to South Africa uh, back in 2019 to commence the high speed test program. Um, and then I'll spend a bit of time at the end um, answering the, um, the never ending question with Bloodhound, which is what on earth happens next? Um, you may have spotted that uh, for I'm not sure whether right or wrong reasons uh, that the project was in the news again last week. I'll explain kind of where the project is at. Um, but also um, for me, I guess, as an engineer and as an aerospace engineer, um, what we're doing now with the technology that we develop for Bloodhound in kind of other applications. So um, I, I think what is what might happen is that you're going to see a video, but perhaps not hear it very well. Um, we'll see how that goes. But I just wanted to show a very short video at the start just to give you a feel for what we're trying to do, I guess, from a technical engineering perspective um, on Bloodhound before I talk about um, what my role specifically has been in this. some screens around uh, on my second monitor. So in a nutshell, I guess from an, a, a technical engineering point of view, that, that's what we're trying to do there in that video, which is make a car go very fast in order to break the land speed record. Um, but actually the broader vision for Bloodhound has always been, and, and this is the reason I'm still involved in it all of these years on, um, as Paul referred to, it's about trying to inspire a new generation of scientists and engineers. Um, so for me, it's a, it's a joy to be with you, even though I'm talking to you from my, my shed at the bottom of the garden uh, this evening. Um, because we want to share this project. We want people to know about it. We want people to be proud of it and, and proud of what British engineers can achieve. Um, so diving into part one, uh, which is about aerodynamic design. So what is fundamentally the big challenge about taking a car to the kind of target speeds we have for Bloodhound? So when I joined the Bloodhound team all the way back in 2007, um, I was told by uh, Richard Noble, who uh, conceived this project, uh, that we were going to design a car to extend the land speed record to 1,000 miles per hour. That has been, and in the back of our minds still is, the ultimate objective of Bloodhound. Um, and this plot here, which kind of looks at the speed of a variety of land speed record cars uh, throughout history, um, gives you a feel for how ambitious this objective is. And these are some of my, my favorite cars, incidentally. So, so going back to the 1920s, uh, Babs and Bluebird there, we're traveling at you know speeds just shy of 200 miles per hour. And um, one of the reasons I love these as a proud Welshman is that uh, these records were broken um, almost at my local beach, just a, a few miles down the coast from where I, I live uh, at Pendine Sands uh, is where those Babs and Bluebird cars broke the record. And then of course, throughout the 20th century, cars got faster and um, things got particularly exciting in the 50s and 60s when we started sticking jet engines and and rockets uh, in, into cars. And the, and the current record, uh, which is uh, held by Thrust SSC, uh, was set back in 1997 on the Black Rock Desert in Nevada, driven by Andy Green, who is also our driver. Um, and that was the first car to officially set a supersonic land speed record. And what we're trying to do is extend that record 
deep into this regime of aerodynamics that we call the supersonic regime. And what's the big deal about taking a car to these supersonic speeds? Well, without spending a long time talking about aerodynamic theory, I guess a big part of this boils down to shock waves. So when you travel or a body travels um, at approaching the speed of sound or faster than the speed of sound, there's an inevitability because of the nature of the governing equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, that you set up these discontinuities in the flow field around the car, known as shock waves. And of course, famously, you know, an observer on the ground when a supersonic aircraft goes overhead hears these disc discontinuities, these sudden pressure jumps, I guess you could think of them as, um, as the sonic boom, you know, the famous sonic boom that Concord created, for example. But the real, uh, the real aerodynamic challenge we have with a supersonic car, of course, is, is by definition, we are rolling across the ground. We have four wheels that are interacting with the ground. So these shock systems that get generated interact not just with the vehicle itself, but also the ground across which it's rolling. And that right from the start was a big headache for us. Like how do we deal with, manage, design the shape of the car such that we can keep control of it? Um, we want it to remain a car at all times and not turn into an aircraft. Um, even though these shock waves are going to be interacting with the ground in a in a complex uh, in a complex way, and very early on it became clear that the the tool to try and understand this complex aerodynamic uh, physics, I guess, um, was not going to be the traditional methods that the automotive industry would have used. Certainly, you know, going back a couple of decades, wind tunnels um, that you know, wind tun real physical wind tunnels are still important tools for the aerodynamicist. But there are some fundamental problems in using wind tunnels for the kind of analysis we needed to do, which was how do we embed our aerodynamic analysis into a design loop that we're going to have to iterate around quickly to advance the design of the car. They're also, of course, extremely expensive to uh, rent or to get time on. And fundamentally, one of the things that is unique to a supersonic land speed record car simply cannot be modelled in the wind tunnel, which is the fact that you have the ground plane rolling underneath the vehicle at extremely high speeds, at supersonic speeds. There are no wind tunnels that can replicate that. Um, so very quickly, it became obvious that we were going to have to rely upon uh, computer simulation to try and help us understand uh, the aerodynamic phenomena of shock being generated by a supersonic car and these shocks and interacting with the ground plane. Now, uh, um, I'm sure uh, some of you out there will be familiar to some extent with, um, you know, the basic principles of how computer simulation work. Um, just to kind of fall back to the basic idea here, which is, well, first of all, you ask yourself the question, what, whatever the problem is, it, you know, there are a whole range of different um, physical problems that are being simulated in this example on this slide the first question you have to ask yourself is do we understand the physics well enough to be able to describe physics mathematically can we come up with a mathematical model a set of equations that describe the physics um, if the answer to that is yes um, more often than not, we quickly realize that that set of equations uh, of running a computational fluid dynamics simulation, an aerodynamic simulation um, over Bloodhound. And I'll kind of labor this point a little bit because it will help me make a point about some of the technology we're developing to improve this process uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, but essentially, we have we have to define the geometry that we want to study the airflow over in some way. Typically, that will be done in a CAD system these days. And then, um, I know some of you out there, I'm sure, will be familiar with uh, with CFD processes. So excuse my kind of hand the hand wavy explanation I'm going to give here. Um, 
But basically, we then break up the space around the vehicle over which we want to solve those equations, which in the context of compressible aerodynamics are the Navier-Stokes equations. And we, we use mesh generators in this particular approach, unstructured mesh generators, to fill the space around the vehicle into an assembly of elements. Um, to be able to do that accurately and generate accurate solutions, you end up with millions, if not hundreds of millions of these cells. Um, and, and, and on each of these cells, we try and solve the governing equations, okay, with each cell effectively talking to its neighbors. Um, and that then lends itself to parallel computing, high performance computing. Um, we've been really lucky on Bloodhound that we've had the support of well, a whole range of um, high performance computing providers, but uh, most recently over the last few years, we've been making use of the, the supercomputing Wales um, high performance computing system, which we have access to um, in universities in Wales. Um, we then assemble the data from the CFD system, um, process it into something that an aerodynamicist or a design engineer can make sense of. Um, so pressure distributions, streamlines, lift and drag predictions, and so on. Um, and we sit, I mean, literally what we would do then, once we get to the end of this flow loop, is sit down together, look at this data, and ask ourselves, well, what changes to the geometry do we need to make to make the car more efficient? Whether that be minimizing the drag, minimizing the lift, um, whatever our objective is. Um, if you are interested in the details of this process, there's a paper that we published um, best part of a decade ago now um, that explores exactly the methods we used. Um, I promise I'm not going to throw a lot of maths at you this evening, but there's just one slide just perhaps um, to preempt a question that, that might come up during the Q&A at the end. Um, because, of course, what's interesting and complicated about land speed record aerodynamics is that, in fact, it's not air that this car is flowing through at all. If you've seen some of the footage of Bloodhound uh, running, and I'll, I'll show you some later if you haven't, um, you quickly realize that it's actually a soup of particles, dust, sand, all kinds of mess in reality that gets entrained into the flow around the car. Um, so we developed specifically for Bloodhound um, a computational model that tries to take into account the impact of entraining particles into the flow, which had never been done at these sorts of speeds. Um, so we have, so we basically had to couple the aerodynamic governing equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, to a set of equations that describe kind of mass and momentum conservation for the particles that get entrained into the flow. Um, and again, if you want more uh, more details on that approach that we used and how effective it was, uh, we published a paper on that um, a few years ago too. Now at the end of the process. Um, of running um, a suite of CFD simulations because the, the approach we took on Bloodhound was to say, well, look, even though the vehicle is accelerating to peak speed and then decelerating back to rest, we're going to assume that the aerodynamic characteristics of the car at any given speed are effectively the same as the, the equivalent steady state um, characteristics, as if the car was sat there at that speed um, in steady state. There, there are question marks about to what extent that assumption is true, but that's let's not get into that here. So, so what we would do is run a series of steady state snapshots at different speeds, or in this case, at different Mach numbers, um, and stitch those um, snapshots together to get a feel for okay, how do how does in, on the left hand side the lift um, acting on the car vary as a function of Mach number? And how does the drag, which is the right-hand graph, vary as a function of Mach number? And the goal always was to try and make the car's response, in terms of its force response, the force is acting on it, as um, insensitive to Mach number as possible. So, so ideally, we have minimum drag um, and also a small amount of downforce acting on the car at all times. Um, you don't want too much downforce. I mean, you could easily generate too much downforce on a car like this and just drive the solid metal wheels into the desert surface that we're rolling across and you end up with the world's fastest plow, not the world's fastest car. So actually the, the problem of managing the lift is more complicated than just how do you keep it on the ground? It's about how do you manage those loads? And as you can see from the left-hand side, as, as much as we try to keep that line as flat as we could, um, it turned out to be impossible. Um, the, the other thing that we would generate to help us to help guide our design decisions 
um, are these kind of plots here where we're looking at pressure distributions over the car. So on the left hand side here, this is an early configuration of Bloodhound from probably, well, uh, going back to probably 2009, 2010. Um, and and on, on the right hand side of, the, of this left figure, you actually see the pressure distribution we're predicting will act on the ground that the, the car is rolling across. And one thing to, to, to spot here, because that will kind of tie in with a specific problem that I'll explain how we solved later on, is what's happening at the back of the car. So at the back of the car at low speed, you see we have um, kind of reds and greens, which represent relatively speaking low pressures. And as the car accelerates, those reds and greens turn into uh, blues and purples, which represent high pressure and therefore lift. And this was a massive problem, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, eventually, we did um, we solve that by subtly changing the geometry at the back of the car. Things hopefully you can spot on the right hand side, which is the actual car geometry that we ended up building and are now testing, is that we managed to remove this the majority of that transition from uh, low pressures to high pressures on the underside of the, the back of the car. Just to give you a flavour of how much work was involved to get us from our initial concept, which I was handed in 2007, all the way through to the car that we actually built, uh, and that design or that the, the outer mould line of the car was frozen probably in 2015 sort of time, so we're talking eight years to go around this loop. Um, and these were the, the various configuration stages of that design process. And of course, at each, each of these stages, we had to manually crank that CFD handle, get all our data out, manually process the data, sit down with our PowerPoint slides around a big, uh, you know, big uh, boardroom table and discuss these things, which, which still is very often, you know, in, in, in industry, the way aerodynamic design is done. Um, which again is, is me trying to make the point that there are better ways of doing this that we're, that we're trying to develop now, which I'll talk about later. Um, so just to home in on one of the specific problems that we had um, and to give you a feel for what kind of methods we used to try and, and solve it. Um, and this is one of the problems, I think, if I'm honest, uh, was one of the times where I thought that we might be taking on something that's impossible here. Um, so again, I'm going to move some windows around so I can actually see what I'm showing you. There we go. Um, so at around about, I think the config six, about six iterations into the design of the car, we were consistently having this problem that's kind of uh, summarized in, in the graph here, that as we were transitioning from relatively low speed, so Mach 0.5, through to su supersonic speeds, the amount of lift being generated at the back of the car was varying massively. So you can see uh, what I'm showing here, the, the pink line is, is the drag coefficient. So this is like a non-dimensionalized drag. Um, the red curve is the amount of lift that would be acting at the front wheels. And the, uh, the, the green line is the, the lift that would be experienced by the rear wheels. So you can see at the rear of the car, driven by that phenomenon I showed you in that plot just a moment ago, you're going from a small amount of downforce at low speed, which is exactly what we want, through to significant amounts of lift by the time you get to Mach 1.1. Um, in fact, we were looking at about 14 tons of lift at Mach 1.1, which, you know, when at this stage in the design, the car was uh, predicted to only be about six and a half tons. Um, immediately, you realize you've got a problem. And ultimately, this was driven by this horrible geometry at the back of the car related to the rear wheels and the rear wheel suspension and the fairings that we had to design to, to wrap around those suspension struts, um, which from an aerodynamics point of view are disastrous. I mean, if you if you if it wasn't car, you just get rid of those wheels and taper the body in nicely and you, that, this problem would go away. So the first thing we did was spend an awful lot of time visualizing the CFD solutions in this region of the car, look at trying to get our heads around why we were getting this problem, like what was driving this problem? Do we understand the physics of this problem? Um, and we got to the point where we realized that we kind of inadvertently set ourselves, cr created for ourselves a kind of converging, diverging nozzle, which is specifically designed, you know, if, if you want to accelerate fluids, um, that's what you use to accelerate a fluid through Mach 1 and to supersonic speeds. And we kind of accidentally created a 
condi nozzle, a, con a con converging diverging nozzle between the rear wheels and the body of the car. So that we were actually accelerating, even at relatively low supersonic speeds, we were accelerating the fluid up to extremely high supersonic speeds um, in that region, just kind of downstream of the, the rear wheel. And, you know, we as a bunch of engineers, we sat down and thought about, well, what options do we have to solve this problem? Geometrically, what parameters could we play with now that we understand what was causing uh, the problem? And we pretty quickly realized, by the way, my, my solution to this was to move the rear wheels backwards. Um, that was kind of my, my pragmatic suggestion. And straight away, the structural engineers told me that I was uh, being crazy and that wasn't possible. Um, so we realized that this was a complicated problem. This is now a complex design optimization problem where you have a complex three-dimensional geometry that could be parameterized using you know, 20 or so parameters. Um, and we still didn't really understand which were the key parameters that we needed to optimize. So our approach was to, first of all, to be able to crank the handle more quickly on the CFD, to turn those computer simulations round more quickly. We simplified the model. So we, we said to ourselves, well, look, if, if this phenomenon is being driven by the flow physics at the back of the car, let's simplify the front of the car. We're not gonna model the front wheels and the engine intake and all of that kind of stuff. We'll focus on the back of the car. We'll split it down the middle and we'll only model half of the car just to make the model um, cheaper to run. So we built up this parametric model that represented the flow physics sufficiently well that we could use it as the basis for optimization. And then we basically swept through all of these different parameters that defined that rear geometry shape. And eventually came down to, we, we kind of narrowed down to five key parameters that seemed to be driving this problem we had. So things like the angle, the boat tail angle, as we called it, the, the angle at which the, the body of the car tapered down, um, the angle of attack of one of the, the key suspension strut fairings and so on. And then we realized that we've got, we've got this kind of parametric optimization problem. And one approach that I'm sure some of you are familiar with um, is to use a, a design of experiments approach. So again, I'm gonna, I'll step through this very quickly, but basically we said, we've got this parametric space we want to know if there's a combination of parameters that will minimize this problem of lots of lift at supersonic speeds. So we sample that design space. And so and this process took us about six months to do in terms of the number of CFD simulations we needed to build up the data set to get sufficient understanding of the problem. It was about six months of pretty much continual cranking the handle, running CFD simulations. And then we said, well, now that we have all this data, can we fit a mathematical function to that data so that we can optimize and try and get rid of that supersonic lift? And fortunately, <laughs> the answer to that question was, yes, we could. So to cut a long story short, at the end of that process of fairly manual, labor-intensive design of experiments-based optimization, we went from this graph, which I showed you earlier, where we've got this problem, which is kind of the, the green curve is the problem here, okay? to the right-hand side behavior where we've got basically on a much flatter curve. We're still generating a small amount of downforce at low speed, but we're now generating a, a small amount of lift, but not an unmanageable amount of lift at supersonic speeds. Um, and, you know, like a good university academic, we thought this is interesting, we should share this with the world, and we uh, wrote a paper on it, and the, the, the details are there. Um, I should say as well, actually, that if, um, if at any point you want to explore any of this in more depth, the, the little QR code at the bottom of my slides, if you scan that, that will take you to a site where you can explore all of this uh, in more detail. So this is it. Uh, by the time we got to lucky or unlucky for some configuration 13 of the car, that was the point where we said, we've got the shape, we've nailed it. We've, we've got an outer mold line for Bloodhound that we think in principle will do the job of taking us uh, to a thousand miles per hour. So the next thing we had to do um, was get the car built. Um, so we're probably talking about timescale wise between 2015 and 2017 now. Um, so it took us two years uh, out of our base um, at this point in Avonmouth, just outside of Bristol. Um, and it was a slow process for a whole bunch of reasons, um, like lots of things on Bloodtown, slow because of, we were heavily reliant on you know, funding coming in, uh, sponsors coming on board, people donating materials to us. Um, and in reality, that dictated some of the design decisions we made. So the original wheel design, for example, was, was a solid titanium wheel design. 
Um, and of course, when we start wanted to then build the car, and we went to companies around the UK saying, "Will you donate us four big slabs of titanium for free?" Um, the response was uh, lukewarm, I think, fair to say. Um, so that was another point on the process where we wondered, well, is there another solution to this? Like, you know, the, the kind of loads these wheels will be generating, you can't, you, you certainly can't stick car tires on this thing. Um, so, so we were heavily reliant on things like the goodwill of engineering companies and sponsors around the uh, around the country, which which is why it really took so long. But we got there in the end. The basic concept for Bloodhound, in terms of the way it's packaged and the the, the underlying structure that sits underneath that skin, um, the, the basic concept is that the rear of the car is a metallic space frame, um, a lot like um, a modern. Um, aerospace vehicle so you've got a mixture of aluminium and steels and a little bit of titanium in there um, and the front half of the car is basically a carbon fiber monocoque um, a lot like a, a modern formula one car um, so that the stress is transferred through the front of the car actually through that carbon fiber skin itself um, and there, there are a whole bunch of reasons why we went for that kind of hybrid aerospace back end automotive front end approach um, which you know if you're interested in uh, perhaps I could talk more about at the end. Um, so here are a few more um, pictures of various points in the build process for the car. Um, and that top left one is one I'm particularly proud of because uh, that's me um, looking less stressed and younger and thinner. Um, about five years ago, uh, when that carbon fiber monocoque arrived at our uh, assembly plant and the covers were pulled off it before anybody could tell me off for jumping in it. I jumped in and asked to have my photo taken so that I could say I was the first person to sit in Bloodhound. So that, that's me, the first, technically the first person to sit in the car. So we did get the car built eventually. Um, uh, the, the build process ended around about 2017, or I think, er, yeah, early 2017 it would have been. Um, I won't go into the details of what we did in the UK in terms of testing, which perhaps some of you, you came to see or, or saw on, on the news. Um, but in 2017, we completed su a successful set of uh, test runs of the car up to just over 200 miles per hour uh, down in Newquay in Cornwall. Um, the car did everything it, we asked of it. So in the, that low speed testing, we, we wanted to know things like how does the engine system, the jet system on the car behave at low speeds? Can we get full thrust from the jet engine even at low speeds? And the answer was yes. Do the wheel brakes work? Pretty important question. Uh, yes, they did, and they didn't overheat, which was good news. So the car did everything it was supposed to do. What didn't go to plan was what, hap what, um, what happened in terms of our sponsorship agreements. Um, I was completely wrong <laughs> about this. For, for the year or so leading up to the, the new key testing, I'd been telling everyone that as soon as we get this car going down a runway with a big flame out the back, it'll be so impressive You know that we'll have companies queuing up to put their name on the side of the car. Um, but it actually had the opposite effect. I think for a lot of people, what we did in Newquay made it all very, very real and therefore perhaps a little bit scary and the risks involved in doing something like this, I think became obvious. Um, I won't go into the long political story of, of the project going into administration and being rescued, but eventually money came into the project, which allowed us to take the car to its ultimate destination that we'd all always planned to run uh, at high speed at which is the hack scheme pan uh, in south africa so we've been preparing this site uh, for many years uh, the, the the biggest thing we had to do as you can see in the top right there is by hand and this was a, a herculean effort was to clear the entire track this kind of 12 mile long by about half a mile wide um, surface of desert with from stones so so we literally hired local people to walk up and down this track for us uh picking up stones clearing the track making sure it's completely clear of debris um it's an incredible place um i was very lucky to get to go out during the testing in 2019 um it's it's i mean to give you a feel for what it is it's it's, it's basically a dried out lake bed it's incredibly flat um in their wet season which is our winter um it, it floods every year and that kind of when when the, the the rains go and it dries out it leaves this beautiful flat um surface which is kind of like dried mud but and it, it's solid enough to hold the car 
but soft enough, just, just about to let the, the wheels kind of grip into the surface. Um, so we took the car to hack scheme pan, and uh, this is tail end of 2019, and we started getting data off of the car, which for me obviously was pretty nerve wracking, having spent a decade saying this is what the car should look like. It is going to stay on the ground. It's not going to take off. We've got the drag down, trust me. And then we had to go and find out whether I was right or not. So we started pulling data off the car. Um, so to give you a feel for some of the thing we were measuring, um, and these are some of the kind of the real um, kind of data visualization. Um, images that I was looking at while we were running the car. Um, so the surface of the vehicle, we had a series of about 150, I think it was 156 in the end, per sensor. So just pressure ports linked to pressure transducers by lots of plastic tubing, um, measuring the pressure as a function of the car speed. Um, and of course, we had our CFD model data, which provided us with the continuous prediction of the pressure distribution over the surface of the car as a function of speed. Um, so we wanted to be able to map the measured data to our CFD data. And of course, you know, the, the dream scenario was we had this perfect mapping Given us confidence for CFD model we use to design the car. These sensors on the car, um, and where the sensors are green, that means that the predicted pressures on the surface of the car uh, were within 10% of what we actually measured um, using those, um, those those pressure ports. Um, and you'll see at low speed, up to about Mach 0.6, you know, with that 10% error tolerance that we allowed ourselves. We were pretty much spot on with the CFD model. Um, and then it's at higher speeds, Mach 0 0.7, 0 0.8. That's when we started getting a few sensors that were drifting a little bit outside of that tolerance band. So, of course, you know, we wanted to understand um, why that was. Um, you know, we can look at that data in a different way and go for all for at different speeds. Um, how what, what does the mapping of what we were measuring to what we were predicting look like? So in each of these plots, you've got uh, CFD model data pressure in, in terms of a pressure coefficient um, against what we actually measured on the car at that particular position at that particular speed and you know you can see it's not perfect if it was perfect every single one of those crosses would sit on that nice uh, y equals x line but clearly we were doing something right um, because that mapping uh, you know it, it was as good as I guess we were we, we were hoping it would be but we did want to understand, you know, what, why, why is it that at certain sensor positions we were getting it wrong? And in fact, it's, it's some, we were getting it horribly wrong. What we were measuring at that sensor port really didn't correspond in any meaningful way to what the CFD was predicting. And more often than not, you know, at the end of a run, I would look at this data, pick the sensor positions that were doing badly and go and have a look at them. And, and very often it was pretty obvious why they were doing a bad job. Um, and it was to do with things like you know them just getting clogged up. So sensor 145, for example, is on the underside of the car, um, and our, once we got up to a certain speed, and kind of mild shock systems were being generated, dust was being sucked up off the desert surface, clogging up the sensor, and um, you know distorting the the measurements. So we spent a lot of time. I mean, fortunately, just this this one shows that if you you know you could pick sensors along that y equals x line. Um, and there were a lot of them sitting on that line uh, where what we were measuring was pretty much bang on what we were predicting. Um, one of the other things that we were interested in measuring for obvious reasons is the loads that the wheels were experiencing. Um, Andy, the driver, often jokes that, you know, a land speed record car is perfectly safe, provided that all four wheels are always touching the ground. We've got nothing to crash into. We've cleared the surface. We've got lots of overrun at either end of the track. So as long as all four wheels are touching the ground, i.e. they're experiencing positive load, um, what can possibly go wrong? I mean, obviously, it is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, so what we're seeing on the left-hand side here are um, so, so the dashed purple line 
Uh, this is for run 33 of the car where we hit a peak speed of 562 miles an hour. So this is the uh, the velocity against time curve, the purple line. Um, the, the black line is the net download acting on the four wheels. If you add up the loads on all four wheels, you get that black line. And then the red and blue lines are how that total load is distributed between the front axle and the rear axle. So the red is the rear axle, the blue uh, is the front axle. And you can see some kind of obvious things that you might expect happening. So when the car starts rolling, i.e. the jet engine kicks in, there's a transfer of load from the rear wheels and onto the front wheels. And then you see aerodynamically, you see both at the front and at the back, at low speed, the the aero loading is pushing the car more and more, further and further or harder and harder down onto the surface. So they're both sloping up. You're generating more and more load as the car accelerates. And it was when we first saw this little hump here on the red curve that it was almost our eureka moment because we've been predicting that we would see this. We knew from our aero predictions, and you can kind of see that on the right hand side here, that we would reach a certain speed around about Mach 0.6 or slightly above Mach 0.6, where we'd reach a point of maximum downforce and then it would start trickling off as we accelerated through that speed and eventually turn into lift. And this is the first time we saw evidence that we were doing exactly that and at almost exactly the speed we predicted. We hit this point of maximum downforce and then even though the car continues to accelerate, the downforce drops off. And in fact, as we push the car faster again, um, so this I think is, um, yeah, the results from the, the, the fastest run that we did, the final run up to 628 miles an hour. And you just, you see that kind of camel hump phenomenon exaggerated again um, there. It's obviously complicated, but in fact, there's a whole bunch of other things happening um, that affect these, uh, the, these download um, curves. But that, that phenomenon that we were predicting was clearly present which again, gave us a lot of confidence. One of the other things we were really pleased with in terms of our ability to predict the overall performance of Bloodhound um, was feeding in our CFD drag predict predictions, which included, uh, if you remember that spray drag model, so we, so we knew that the, the particle entrainment would influence the overall drag on the car. So including that particle entrainment drag term in, in that model, we were able to plug all of our force predictions into basically an F equals MA solver um, and, and predict the performance of the car. And by the end of our high speed testing phase, we, would be, we were able to do this incredibly accurately. Don't worry too much about the thrust lines. Um, the difference between these two is not worth uh, explaining. But the, the blue curve here is what Bloodhound actually did um, in terms of velocity against distance. Um, compared with what prior to the run we had predicted it would do based on our performance model driven in part by our CFD predictions. And you can see we're pretty close to predicting exactly what the car did. Um, in fact, the car slightly overran our prediction, uh, ended up I think about a quarter of a mile further along the track than we predicted. So before I move on to kind of conclude things and wrap things up, um, let me show you a little video. Again, I'm not sure if you're going to get the audio or not on this, but th this should give you a little flavour um, of, of altogether what we achieved um, during the high-speed testing programme uh, back in 2019. <laughs> Is now in Hello, Nicole. Good morning. Temperature is plus two five and pressure nine two one millibars. I'm 
Control ends confirm all is bloody good and we're just celebrating for a few minutes. Over. Okay, I'll I'll stop that there. Um, so as easy as that, naught to uh, 628 miles an hour and back down to zero in about a minute and a half, two minutes, something like that. Um, making Bloodhound unofficially just during its testing. Um, the fourth fastest car in the world. Um, and this is before we've even put the rocket system on board. So, of course, the plan was uh, to bring the car back to the UK, get the rocket system installed during 2020, and around about now, uh, 2021, start prepping to take the car back for an assault on the record uh, this year in 2021. And, of course, we all know what happened in 2020, uh, which has pretty much put things on, on hold. Uh, it's also, of course, given us all sorts of headaches in terms of how we fund the project going forward, uh, where new sponsors are going to come from. Um, so at the moment, the big question is, um, and this is the harsh reality of Bloodhound, is within the next 12 months, either we need to have funding in place to take the car back to South Africa for a record attempt, or uh, the National Motor Museum in, uh, or the Transport Museum in Coventry has kindly offered a home to Bloodhound, which is where it will end up this time next year if we don't have a new sponsor on board. So it's all up in the air in terms of Bloodhound. Um, just to wrap up, to give you a feel for the kind of work that this has inspired and is now kind of fueling a lot of the research that I'm doing um, at Swansea University. Um, I laboured the point a little bit about how um, kind of in manually intensive and kind of human time intensive um, traditional approaches to embedding CFD analysis into the design cycle. And this, this is a typical aerospace design cycle you're seeing here. And as you can see, CFD is at the heart of it. So um, inspired by some of the, the work we did on Bloodhound and to solve particular problems related to Bloodhound, um, I've been working on a series of projects developing um, automated uh, computational optimization methods uh, based on uh, based on trying to solve the problem of how you parameterize a complex geometry based on the CFD grid itself. Um, we solved using this method. We solved some quite interesting problems. Um, so this is kind of uh, what we refer to as the inverse design of an aerofoil, where you know the pressure distribution you want your aerofoil to be able to achieve. You just don't know what shape it needs to be to achieve that pressure distribution. And we've used um, genetic evolutionary algorithms, so kind of population-based algorithms, where you're testing lots and lots and lots of designs at every design iteration to try and figure out if you can kind of automatically, within uh, with, with the human really not in the loop at all, um, design this aerofoil shape. Um, um, so that was, we, this is, and this is a particularly tricky problem we're solving here where there's actually a shock system sitting on the aerofoil. Um, we then kind of in parallel with this, uh, started teaming up with our colleagues over in the computer science department. I was one of the joys of working at a university as you of course bump into all sorts of different people. Um, and I bumped into, in the days where you could bump into people in coffee shops, do you remember those days? Um, uh, a professor in computer science who, who knew a little bit about the work I was doing. Um, and his expertise is in um, data visualization. And he said, oh, you know, ping across some of your CFD data sets to me with a little description of, of you know, what, what they are and what you're interested in. And he started coming to, back to me with kind of 
these flow visualizations, which were far more effective, I thought, than anything I was able to generate manually, that were being generated automatically with his algorithms. Again, if you want more details on that, here's there's the relevant paper. And, and, and a combination of those two things has basically kind of um, been the platform for a whole new body of work uh, that I'm involved in now, where we're looking at how do you embed people into otherwise kind of purely computational optimization processes using a combination of using a human designer to actually in in real time engage with an optimization algorithm and point it in in, in the direction um, that you want it to go and also learn from what the optimization algorithm is doing through uh, data visualization so We've got a number of projects that we're working on at the moment where we're exploring how do you present data in a meaningful way to a design engineer who is working with a computer system to design an end product. And there are a whole bunch of projects uh, ranging from some of you might know about the Reaction Engine Skylon uh, space plane project um, through to kind of bio bioelectric uh, commuter aircraft. We're even now venturing into the world of hydrodynamics and seeing if we can use these methods to, de to de design the hulls. Um, on high-speed uh, marine craft. So the exciting thing for me is whatever happens with Bloodhound, um, it, it's already been doing the job uh, that Paul referred to right at the start, which is inspiring people. And it's been inspiring us and, and my research team um, to look at new innovative computational optimization methods and approaches. So I've been talking for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes. So it's probably time for me to shut up um, and I will uh, just say thank you for listening. Thank you for being here this evening. It's always a joy to share the project. And if there are any questions, I will endeavour to answer them as best I can. Ben, thank you. That was really good. I really enjoyed that. Um, I've, I've got a couple of questions. Um, which is really sort of part of my, my techiness, my in, in, innate techiness. When you play that first video, I saw that there were rivets and little divots inside the skin where the rivets had got in, so it wasn't all a nice flush surface. Yeah. So I presume when you were modeling how that, that, uh, that airflow worked, you weren't modeling the exact skin, you're modeling an approximation of it? Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, often people are surprised when they come and see the car in real life that it's not perfectly smooth. It's, you know, it's got small lumps and bumps and rivet holes and all sorts on it um, because, you know, we, we, we were never we were never pretending that we were going to be able to to generate a, a what you describe as like a laminar flow vehicle where you keep the turbulence down to an absolute bare minimum. To, to reduce the skin friction. The dominant forces that act on a car at these kind of speeds or, or any vehicle at these sort of speeds are related to the shock systems. And they don't care about things at that scale, right? Um, you know, so you're right, you, you end up with an approximation to that actual geometry. Um, it's, it's an approximation partly because you want it to be an approximation. You don't want to be trying to model things at that fidelity because it would just be too computationally expensive. Um, but also the kind of, the tr you end up with a triangulation of that um, geometry which kind of smooths over those things anyway so uh so yeah in reality it, it's not important to the kind of resolution that we're interested in so i suppose um the the corollary to that resolution question then is when you talk about the spray drag and you've got this array of particles coming up in different sizes yeah you must have had upper and lower limits of how big or small you thought the bits were going to be yeah. So, yeah. In, well, in reality, that the the the, um, the spray drag model is not a particle based model. So, you, so you're not ever modeling individual particles. It, it's based on a a mathematical description of the impact of particles at a whole range of different length scales. So you can actually tune the model based on um, what your assumption is about the, the sizing of the particles that, that enter into the flow. Um, so what we actually did in order to try and tune the model was you know years before we took the car to Hackskin Pan, we went to Hackskin Pan and got lots of samples of the desert surface and you know filtered the samples to work out what kind of distribution of particle size you get and you can feed that into the mathematical model. Um, so kind of in a in a roundabout way you are kind of taking into account a whole range of, of, of particle sizes. 
but you're, you're, you're more modeling the um the spray drag as a as a thick fluid then yeah that first yeah. Could, yeah that's 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 the way to think of it yeah, yeah. now we have i have a question let's see what do we have here Question from Angus Pinkerton. Um, why do you think Bloodhound has not been as successful as the British America's Cup team in US Team UK in recent <laughs> funds? They appear to have a budget of 100 million thanks to their sponsor, Jim Radcliffe. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. I wish I knew the answer, really. Um, it probably boils, it boils down to a bunch of stuff. I mean, it's more risky, I would say. Uh, there is there is an inherent risk involved in what we're doing. I guess you you know in a in a sport that's as, as established as America's Cup that whatever happens, you know, there's there's going to be a huge global audience for this. You know, in terms of brand reputation, that, that there's less risk. You know, the reality is, you know, however much modelling we do, we are taking this car into unknown territory and you know no, nobody wants their brand on the side of a car that's failing in a catastrophic way um sure you just write yeah, the I don't know. I, I, down. yeah <laughs> <laughs> we we i shouldn't say this but uh yeah we we we, we joke every I mean, obviously i'm based at swans university so our big rival is a cardiff university i hope it's a healthy rivalry but we did joke about uh putting swans university on the side of the car and writing Cardiff University on the underside of the car, just in case the iconic shot of blood <laughs> in the field <laughs> with the car flipping up. Um, yeah, I, it's um, and I, and I think there's probably an element now as well, and I think we have to be honest about this now about how green this project is perceived to be, right? So, um, I mean, I would argue that um, you know, compared to something like Formula One, or even compared to attending an international academic conference the co2 emissions from bloodhound are negligible you know we run the car for like a minute at a time um but i think the perception of bloodhound is that perhaps it's not a green project which is often what you know big companies are trying to align themselves with today um my my gut feeling now is that if we get the money in to complete the project which i you know i'm an optimistic person i, I think we will it's probably going to be a wealthy benefactor um rather than a big corporate but who knows the reality is we're so close now <laughs> and we've got i mean you, i mean what we did in 2019 in south africa was really de-risk the project like we know how this car behaves we know exactly you know what our, what additional thrust we need to get it to a land speed record we've validated the cfd model you know in, in some some level there's you know there's not a lot that could go wrong now because we we understand the car so well. Um, so yeah, who, who who knows? We'll see. I would have thought it'd been quite a, a green thing. Now they've got the new rocket engine design, which is basically a supercharged steam engine. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, the rocket system, which we're planning to put in this, is yeah, it just pumps out water and oxygen out the back. Um, so if you know, as long as you've manufactured your hydrogen peroxide in a sustainable way, it doesn't get much greener than that. Um, Again, I think it's 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 more of a perception thing than a reality. Like the, you know, we we when we talked about this uh, and when we were in South Africa, we you know we were, we were saying the reality is the the carbon footprint of the project of a fly, of flying the team to South Africa and back was far greater than the operation of the car. Um, so you know, it's it's a difficult one. Yeah, and I and I I, I don't I, I guess I'm too involved in it to really and get a, a real feel for what. The perception of it is from the outside so i've got a follow-up question here from angus um do you know if any of your fluid dynamics work has been used by america's cup yacht designers <laughs> um not ours so if you're talking specifically about the cfd model that we that we use as our kind of core code at swansea no um but cfd has been used extensively yeah for america's cup um uh boats um, I, I don't know what they use, but they, they will be using CFD for sure. Question from Mike Reed, uh, and he's already 
full disclosure, he's got a picture of SSC signed by Richard Noble. Is Richard Noble still involved in the project? He's not, no. So uh, when, so in 20, uh, where are we, 2017, when the, the project went into administration, um, it got completely bought out. Uh, so it ended up with a new owner. And Richard, I think, uh, rightly or wrongly, decided that the best thing was just to, to, to walk away from it. He, it wasn't his thing anymore. And, um, you know, I, I know Richard Noble very, very well. He's, he's, uh, he's become a good friend of mine. And I think he would have found it very difficult to stay involved in something that he wasn't in charge of. Um, so he's, you know, he's been a good friend to the project, and we have consulted him at various stages. But um, yeah, he, he's not involved anymore. At what point is Andy Green going to put his foot in the accelerator and say, "Wee"? It always <laughs> sounds so calm, so calm. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, he's an RAF fighter pilot. That's what he was trained to do. So. Um, yeah, it is. It is remarkable. He is. He's. He's. He's quite. Quite the individual. Um, it was fascinating to watch him doing the testing program. You know, every, every time he got out of the car, it'd be straight back to the office, sit down, process all the data, get all of his. You know, his driver's logs filled in, and yeah, he's. Um, yeah, he's a remarkable character, and I think you know the the right person to be driving the car. Um, so yeah. Question from Ian Brownlee. Uh, from a machine learning perspective, what model type do you use to predict your values and how long did it take to compute? RNN, yes. CNN. Yeah, so we're not, I mean, we're not using machine learning in the strict, not if I'm honest, I'm not a computer scientist. So um, how exactly you define machine learning? Um, I don't know, but, but yeah, in the, probably in the stricter sense, we're not using machine learning. We do use some tools that can help us um, speed up the CFD simulations, um, things like reduced order modeling. I mean, you're not speeding up the CFD simulation. You're, you're getting new solutions in a in a quicker way based on on data that you know. So we do use or did use um, kind of reduced order modeling approaches, particularly when we were doing some of the the, the very intensive turnaround optimization. Um, activities i just i mean to give you a feel for what a full fidelity cfd simulation for bloodhound would take i mean we were running on grids so these these meshes around the car of, of the order 100 million cells um and typically i'd be running on kind of across 256 cores um of the, the hpc system and to get a single steady state solution so that's a converged solution at a single speed on 256 cores would probably take best about 24 hours of runtime on 256 cores. Um, so you you know you you scale it up if if every time you study the car you actually want to run say 10 simulations at 10 different speeds. Um, you know it's 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 pretty intensive computationally. How does that that um, computational runtime change over time as the model varied and the underlying computer hardware must have varied yeah the, course of uh, the, the bigger one is, is is computer hardware i think um the actual i mean the actual modeling it's i mean the, the the algorithms you're throwing at the machines aren't really changing throughout the project i mean arguably we were improving them a little bit as we went along the, the big difference and, and this surprised me you know as someone at the start of blood who was pretty new to high performance computing you know it was every few years where the university i mean at the start we were using um university in-house machines and you know every few years the university would upgrade its hpc system and i would be pleasantly surprised how much quicker uh, we'd be running i mean we we easily over the few years that we were working on like heavily working on the aero modeling would have half the run times um the kind of wall clock run times needed for simulations just because of hardware improvements i would i would guess Nice to see computing has some use. Um, one question here. Was there anything that, this is from Simon Harbership, was there anything the team would have done differently to provide more reassurances and mitigate perceived risk? Yeah, good question. Good question. Would we have done anything differently? Um, <laughs> yeah, good question. I mean, there's an argument about, you know, 
you know, we were often we often considered, you know, should we have designed like designed the whole test program for the car so that you basically ran it um, autonomously initially? So you don't, you know, you, you you prove the car is is safe without a human in it. Um, that, that that debate went on and on. Um, ultimately, Andy, the driver, put his foot down and said, no, like the safest way to operate Bloodhound is for me to have maximum amount of time I possibly can in the car, learning how the car behaves. Uh, because you know, obviously, we're doing all this in a budget, so to 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 you know, to step the car up autonomously without the driver in it, and then go right, Andy, you now need to learn how to, to control this and do it all over again, it would would have been extremely expensive. Um, I think in in reality, though, I mean, th there was nothing. I mean, one of the the great things about the the high speed test program was that there was nothing really shocking. You know, the the car the car didn't do anything. That made us think, goodness me, we should have done that differently, which um, you know, certainly not from an aerodynamic design point of view, um, which was obviously a big relief. Um, uh, arguably, the fin is a little bit too big, um, so so the car was a little bit more crosswind sensitive than um, than perhaps we had predicted. Um, but yeah, all in all, I mean, in terms of the design itself, there's, there's nothing I would change. Um, the, there's how am I, how am I going to say this? In the the pretty pictures at the start, where you showed how the the airflow was going over the body, and you could see the areas of of compression, um, did that complicate the whole modelling system? Because obviously, where the airflow goes from subsonic to supersonic varies across the body both in terms of height width length underside overside yeah i mean for, fortunately the, i mean the governing equations take deal with that for you okay so so the you know the the, the navia stokes i mean i didn't go into the maths tonight for perhaps obvious reasons um but those governing equations are valid across the entire mac range whether the, the flow is locally supersonic locally subsonic um what that I guess the, the the challenge computationally is that a shock wave, by definition, is an extremely high gradient phenomenon. So, so it's it's a close to discontinuity in the pressure field and the density field. Um, so, what you want to do in terms of the grids that you're modeling this on, um, like where you're capturing the data, is throw lots of cells, lots of grid points. In the region of the shock systems. Now, of course, as the car accelerates, particularly through the transonic regime, the position of these shock waves is varying massively. So, getting the right grids, getting you know, getting the right data capture points for different speeds is a challenge. That that's probably where the computational challenge associated with like what you're talking about is. Okay, I think this is the final question. Um, how? How difficult was it to work with the engineers to come up with the right shape at the front for the air intake to slow down the air to get into the engine at the right speed? Yeah, I thought I thought the end of the question was just how how difficult was it to work with the engineers? Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a joy to work with the engineers on Bloodhound. I, I would say you know of, of all the things I've enjoyed most about being on Bloodhound, it's it's been working alongside some absolutely brilliant people. Um, but yeah, in terms of the air intake, um, without Rolls Royce's input, which I'm not sure, perhaps that's what you're referring to specifically, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, I, you know, I came into this not having ever designed a jet intake before, and you know, fairly naively, even though my background is in aerospace engineering, thought, well, you know, as long as you've got a hole that's roughly the right sort of size, you know, is, that's all you need. It, I mean, it turns out that you, it, you're absolutely right. Going decelerating the airflow down from supersonic speeds to you know the, the jet compressor phase wants to see flow hitting it at about Mach 0.5 Mach 0.6 that sort of speed so decelerating the flow from supersonic speeds down to you know relatively low subsonic speeds through that intake system is an incredibly complicated aerodynamic problem um and in reality there's we wouldn't have been able to do that without rolls royce's support who of course you know that's their bread and butter they do this day in day out um so you know so even down to things like the cockpit itself the shape of the cockpit you might just think well that's just the bubble you needed to have there for andy to see out 
was actually that shape specifically to generate a shock system that begins that process of decelerating the air even before it enters into the intake and then gets decelerated further within the intake um so yeah but you know i think like anything right i mean did, did we all get on all of the time no of course we didn't you know they're d different different people with different responsibilities for different aspects of the design um do have different priorities so you know particularly i mean i hinted at it when talking about the the rear wheel and rear of the car optimization work as aerodynamicists you know we were shouting get rid of the wheels move the wheels further back you know we and, and the structural designers were tearing their hair out saying that you know the, you don't realize how complex the structure will become if we put the wheels there and so on so you know they, they, it wasn't they were they were heated debates let's put it like that i'm glad to hear they were <laughs> Um, final comment then is from uh, Stephen Peacock. Many thanks for a very clear and engaging talk that even a layperson could follow. Uh, that's, thank you very much. That's very kind. So um, I, I think that's it. I think we're done. Unless anybody has any last last questions, it's my here just to say we will uh, put this up on our website. I know there was some problems with bandwidth and video during this presentation. I'll try and sort that out in the uh, version we put up on our website. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Um, so, on behalf of everybody here, Ben, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, it's been an absolute joy. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for, for, for being with me this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And good night, everybody. Stay safe.